Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Kevin Key, ISACA's IT Professional Practices Principal. Joining me today to talk about his recently released article, How Social Engineering Bypasses Technical Controls, is Risk Specialist Alan Ziwa. Alan, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine and you, Kevin, and thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Before we get started, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'll probably start with my uh, educational background. I, I hold two undergraduate degrees. Uh, one I majored in agricultural economics and business, and another in information technology. And then I also hold uh, two graduate degrees, one in finance uh, and another in business administration from the University of Texas at Dallas. And I'm currently completing a master's degree with Brown University in Rhode Island in cybersecurity. I started working in technology in 2007. Uh, my first job was actually configuring antivirus software uh, for Verizon Communications. And I also worked for other two telecoms. And then I joined Ernest & Young uh, for cybersecurity. And now currently I'm in the regulation, uh, regulatory industry where I work with financial institutions in the United States. Awesome. Well, thanks again uh, for being here. So let, let's get in the article. Uh, how would you define social engineering? Well, social engineering is about exploiting human uh, trust uh, or human courtesy or, or using a deception uh, to gain favors uh, for information uh, that can lead to accessing a computer network or a computer system. Uh, so it's just a way of um, trying to get, you know, access to computers without authorization by deception. That's pretty much what social engineering is all about. Yeah. So talking about that human deception, uh, why is social engineering manipulation so prevalent and hard to combat? Well, it's prevalent, prevalent because um, yes, technology advances, companies uh, you have better ways of applying technical controls. So these technical controls act as roadblocks uh, for attackers. So the only way they can access or bypass those multiple roadblocks like firewalls uh, and multi-factor authentication is to trick an employee. Uh, usually they focus on uh, customers facing employees uh, to divulge information. So once the the employee is unaware and they fall for the trick, that's how they can get into the system. I think you've been reading uh, lately in the media uh, one of the big companies that uh, distributes food. Uh, I think it's Uber Eats. Uh, there was a report in the New York Times that they challenge, and it's reported in the New York Times that. The attacker just convinced or persuaded an employee to give information. That's how they got into this network. So it's going to continue. It will continue to be around, uh, and it's getting worse. Yeah, absolutely. With Uber, you know, they have some sort of robust uh, security posture, but you know, with social engineering, all it takes is you know, falling one maybe privileged uh, employee. So moving on to a little bit more of privacy laws, what are some of the negative outcomes of the US uh, lacking strong privacy laws? Well, uh, for social engineering, it includes the process called discovery and investigation. When the attacker is trying to get information of how to approach the target. So because in the United States, we don't have uh, strong federal privacy laws, many companies just post information of employees, of just regular consumers online. So that makes it easier for attackers to gather information and track probably, probably the behavior of the, um, the target on social media as well. And then they can craft a very uh, tricky message uh, to make sure the person will click on it somehow. So that's that's pretty much what it is. 
Awesome. So do you agree with the description that I claim social engineering is one of the most inventive methods of gaining access to sensitive information or related systems? And if so, why or why not? Yeah, I do agree, uh, primarily because social engineering has been evolving over the years. Um, there are some tricks that are now known to most consumers or to most employees. And those old tricks cannot work now at this point because people are aware. I mean, they won't click on certain links or certain types of messages. So the attackers, especially the sophisticated, sophisticated ones like uh, nation uh, set sponsored threat actors, they really uh, dig uh, into people's behavior, culture. You know, if they are targeting an American, uh, versus a, in, 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 uh, a, a European based in England, even the language is different. You know, they got to know they are taking an, an American, so they they it's it's customized uh, and it requires some sophistication in the understanding of human behavior and human weaknesses. Um, so that that's pretty much why I say uh, it's very inventive. If you think of all the types of just examples of social engineering types. We got fishing, we got spear fishing, whaling, smishing, fishing, uh, baiting. Yeah, all those are creative ways uh, of trying to reach a target. Yeah, so you're talking about some of the more inventive methods of uh, social engineering. What are some of the examples of popular forms? I know you mentioned some fishing examples, but uh, what, what kind of examples are you seeing in the field today? <laughs> Well, the, 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 the most common and most popular that remains is the fishing one, uh, because most of us, we use um, the internet so much, you know, email, um, and we also use our mobile, you know, our cell phones all the time. So phishing uh, works in, in the sense that they can craft an email Let's say if uh, somebody was trying to target you in ISACA, they would have to craft an email that looks like ISACA, right? Uh, and they would have to probably to spoof a co-worker uh, at ISACA. So if an email appears to be uh, coming from Lucy to you, uh, you might not think for a moment that, you know, it's it, it, this is um, social engineering or, you know, this is fraud, fraud fraudulent. So you are likely to click, but before you, you, you realize, <laughs> you've already clicked maybe on an embedded link. So phishing is very common. Actually, I saw one this morning uh, that was sent to Brown University students. Um, and, but you know, when you click, when you check on the email, you see it's not coming from the domain. Um, so I just deleted that email. So phishing is very uh, popular. And um, the other one, the spear fishing one, uh, it need, they need more information initially to to do it. It's it's targeting a particular group of people. Uh, the whaling is looking uh, for CEOs or chief executives, whatever. Uh, but those are the most common. And also these days, uh, there's something they call smishing, where they use text messages. Uh, since most of us are bound to our cell phones, uh, text messages we we can casually just read them without paying too much attention and end up clicking on some links. So those are the most common ones. Yeah, it definitely pushes the importance of not only phishing awareness, but security awareness as a whole. Uh, so you write that regarding social engineering, humans are the weakest link. Uh, why do you say that? Well, uh, as human beings, <laughs> you know, we are socialized to be courteous, uh, to be friendly. If somebody comes to you asking for help, you are likely to help. Uh, you know, just imagine the physical security one whereby uh, you see a, a UPS guy by the door when you're getting into your office building. You know, you're likely to hold the door for them, but they may not be a UPS person at all. Uh, they may be piggybacking, right? Uh, so this courtesy, just being nice to other people uh, and trusting, you know, creating trust to something familiar. If, if somebody is familiar to you, you're bound to have a level of trust. And that trust is what uh, social engineers try to build. Once they gain your trust, 
you are likely to divulge some information to them, which they will definitely uh, use for attacks. Absolutely. So moving on from trust back to a little bit of uh, privacy law reform. So how would organizations benefit from these privacy laws we previously talked about uh, reforming these laws and enhancing security awareness? Okay, so this issue is tricky um, because most tech giant companies, they benefit from the lax laws of privacy because they want to sell our information, right? They make money from advertising, from targeted advertising. So those guys are not really happy with strict privacy laws, right? Because their revenue is based on uh, ads, commercial ads and all that. But for companies that do not uh, make their money from ad revenues or internet, those are the ones to benefit most uh, from privacy laws. But overall, all companies would benefit from strict privacy laws, just like it's happening in Europe now. Um, you know, because that information that we are letting all over the place, at least in the United States, it's what's causing uh, social engineering to thrive in the United States more than anything else. Uh, you know, you, you, you are trying to target a, an employee. You could just go on, on LinkedIn, you look at their profile, you know, the, the, the systems that they, they use at work, you know, it's out there. And you can even find their personal emails, their cell phone numbers on some websites, uh, and it's illegal. Uh, so that's a situation that is a disadvantage to us because a person in China, of course, can just look at those websites and know more about an American than we know about somebody in Beijing. So privacy laws would benefit the overall, you know, um, would benefit us, but there's this issue, the commercial motivation uh, or the companies that benefit from selling our information they don't want. So they are lobbying and continue to lobby uh, lawmakers. So unless we have a GDPR equivalent legislation in the United States, it's going to be very difficult um, to have strong private. I know there are three states that have private laws but it just applies to those particular states. I think California is one of them, uh, but the rest of the states, they don't have any. And it's a battle between security and the commercial benefit of um, putting our information all, all over the place. Absolutely. So, so to work together, to look for help, to look for solutions, what role do both employers and employees play in mitigating social engineering threats today and in the future? Well, yeah, so since most corporations, organizations are investing a lot, billions or millions of dollars uh, in technical controls and security, the only other thing that they should invest in after that is uh, security awareness. They need to continue all these uh, phishing campaigns that they test if, if they have um, employees who are still clicking on those emails, they should continue uh, to repeat those. And um, they should also try to simulate real um, tricky, you know, you know, the way the attackers do, like creating fake emails uh, using the actual, um, you know, domain or, you know, whatever, you know, display that can trick somebody because most of the phishing campaigns employ employers are doing they're not as sophisticated as, as what's done by the attackers so i think we need to step up on, on our security awareness and do it more frequently most companies do it once a year but it's probably good to do uh twice a year and uh to continue to make the phishing attempts more uh, so phishing uh campaigns more sophisticated to mirror what actually happens in the real world. Awesome. Well, Alan, you've covered a lot of ground, but before we close out, is there anything else you'd like to highlight for our audience? Yes, uh, we should continue our campaigns, uh, security awareness campaigns, and emphasize on those more than just the technical, because right now, 
most corporations are just focusing on the technicals, you know, defense in depth, and it's good. Um, they, they are investing in new technologies, but overlooking uh, the gravity of social, I mean, of security awareness. Since we employees at the weakest link, as we discussed earlier on, the focus is now on us uh, to improve on our behavior. Uh, so employees should be eager, should be made aware that they, they are part of the defense, even if they, their job, their daily job is, is nothing to do with security. Uh, if, if they are maybe just customer service or sales people, they should be aware that they have a role to play in security of the company, and that should be emphasized. Awesome. Well, Alan, that was a great ending takeaway. Uh, you and I could probably talk about this stuff all day, uh, but that's all the time we have left. Thank you again for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you, Kevin, for inviting me, and I appreciate it so much. If you want to read Alan's full article, click on the link in the description below. I'm Kevin Key. Thank you for tuning in.